Um, so I only read, I think it was yesterday, that this was about storytelling. I kind of forgot about that. So about half twelve last night I made this into a story. So it might not be a very good one, but it does have a beginning, a middle, and then. There's no uh, sort of car crashes or exciting bits. But it, hopefully it'll work. Uh, which one do I press? No, that's it. Oh. Reveal. Right, um, so my story is about my relationship with nature and how I spent my whole life trying one way or another to try and save it because I think biodiversity is really cool and I think it's something that we should all be doing. Uh, I got into nature conservation, I got into wildlife at a really early age, but I'm not going to tell my entire life story because I've only got five minutes. So I'm going to start off um, when I finished my masters about a decade ago. And when I did my masters, I found out about amazing things like common agricultural policy, which is like 60% of the EU budget and it trashes everything and it's really important. So I thought legislation and policy, those are the really important things. You can change a tiny paragraph and you make a massive change. All my friends on the course were doing sort of chainsawings and getting outset chicks and you know doing sexy stuff. But I thought changing a few words would be amazing. So that's where I sort of set my career path onto. Uh, and I worked at RSPB for quite a long time uh, in various different roles. And when I was doing that policy role, my organisation and all the other conservation organisations here did make some quite big changes. But they were against the background of big declines. So if we saw earlier the State of Nature report, I know uh, otters have gone up, but actually generally things are losing out quite badly. I'm not going to labour on threat, that's one of the things the Common Course report says not to do, so hopefully I'm not going to do that too much. But the scale of what we were getting wasn't proportionate to, to what we actually needed. And in my role at RSPB, I did feel sometimes like my role was about managing an inevitable decline. And I didn't want to do that, and I don't want to be part of that. What I want to do is make a world where there's more wildlife and that more people can enjoy it. So I want to be kind of positive vision, not just something that's talking about the inevitability of everything going down the toilet and, and making small changes against that background. And one of the really important aspects in understanding why things are going on is public concern. So there's a lot of polls there in some of our reports and stuff that say that public concern about the environment is at a 20 year low. So I think one of the most important things is understanding the motivation of the public and getting public support for what we're doing. And I've gone from a position where I thought conservation was all about really specific species under threat, you know, things like the bit bitten and stone curly, and decision making makers and politicians. And I've gone from that place on a journey, if you like. I don't, I don't like using that because I think it sounds a bit like that, but maybe if I hadn't done it that way, it would have sounded like that. <laughs> I am worse than me, never mind. Forget that whole bit. Right, uh, so. So I, I went from that idea of, of trying to influence these small number of decision makers about a very small number of species to understanding that there's actually only one keystone species that we should be focusing loads of our effort on. You know, the ultimate flagship species, the ultimate charismatic megafauna, which is humanity. And that's really what conservation is about at the moment and will be for the next few years. Well, things that, uh, I don't know what the last bit was. Um, <laughs> so, so luckily for me, lots of people have been studying humanity and the way it behaves for a long period of time. So it's not a new thing. There's decades of research on what people's motivation is and, and where it comes from. So one of the main things we've done in our, our report is uh, based it on a couple of models, one's by Tim Cass and one's by Schwartz. I can't basically convey all of it in five minutes because usually it takes three hours, but it looks nice. Basically, uh, Schwartz, went 65 different countries, did 165,000 surveys, massive uh, data set, and found that the, there were 60 values that occur within all cultures, right? And actually some of these values are connected to pro-environmental behavior, which like these ones here, which are intrinsic. Uh, and some oppose pro-environmental behavior, so they're not, they, they work against it. And basically, uh, the Common Cause for Nature report was commissioned by all these lovely organisations, and um, what they got us to do is to look at the communications and the experiences they offer, and look at which in values they engage, and whether they're engaging the right values in order to make people feel more motivated and get out and do stuff, so active, be, be active citizens. 
So one of the things we did see apparently quite a lot is a lot of, we've just been talking in the last couple of sessions actually, a lot of um, the focus was on just getting membership, getting people in, getting money out of people, rather than being more about autonomy, more about getting people to do the things themselves. So I think there's a, a really important question for the conservation sector, if we are going to achieve our ultimate goal of, of saving wildlife and making a better world for people and, and wildlife, is to understand that it's not just about growing our organisations, it's about growing more active citizens. And I think there's some really complicated issues, oh, I've got a minute, some really complicated issues that, that come between those two things, that they can work against it, you can, work your, you can grow your organisation at the cost of making people more motivated, um, We've got some recommendations. Don't rely purely on threat. Threat is helpful in highlighting a problem, but don't rely on it solely. Don't ignore the problems. Avoid the, I'm going really quickly, because there's a tiny story I want to tell you at the end. Uh, don't confuse people. Portray your organisations. Don't portray your organisations as, as a superhero. So say everyone's got an active part in it. It's not like the organisation does it, and no one's got a role. So it's not the conservation is done by one organisation. It's done by all of us. So that's what. I mean by not portraying people as a superhero, the organisation as a superhero. Uh, talk more about amazing nature as using spine pictures, there's been a thing about that already today. Talk about caring for other people, uh, give members support to active roles, be clear about what problems are, make solutions to watching the problem. Okay, really, really quick, last thing. Someone who's involved with the project, they said to me, they, they work in comms, I don't know if they're in the room actually, and they said to me, before I got involved in Common Cause for Nature, I sometimes thought, I wish I'd done a biology degree or something more related to conservation. But now I've done this, and I understand it's important to motivate people, I actually feel that communication is conservation. And I couldn't have asked for a better outcome than that. Thanks, sorry, that was mega rushed. <laughs>